Dear Esther was originally developed as a mod for Half-Life 2 and then reproduced for a commercial release following an arts grant allowing for this development to take place. The game is often referred to as the origin point for the walking simulator, which is a really funny term that gets tossed around mostly at games that are just slow. It's used as a negative as well for when longer games dare to commit the crime of slowing down the player for five minutes to hit a narrative beat, usually along the lines of, oh my god, this is turning into a walking sim. And to be fair, sometimes that criticism is valid, but there's nothing inherently wrong with a game where the gameplay is slow and deliberately has you spend your time looking and listening. Some of my favorite story-based games are walking sims. What Remains of Edith Finch, Firewash, The Stanley Parable, and The Beginner's Guide. For what it's worth, I don't think it's a coincidence that Davy Reedon worked on three of those games. I say all this as a preamble because I want you to also approach this experience the way that I did, with no preconceived notions about the game other than the fact that it's known as the first walking sim. A lot of times when you go back, the games that did it first are often not quite as revolutionary as they once were. With the original Doom, which I covered recently, that wasn't the case at all. That game still slaps today, but I don't know what to expect with Dear Esther. Upon booting up the game, what I definitely did not expect was to immediately get an achievement for drowning. As the game faded in and the narrator spoke, I realized that it was going to let me keep walking into the water, so naturally, I just kept walking. And I drowned. The other thing I immediately did is what I imagine almost every player immediately did, which is to walk into the house standing directly before them and look around. There's a chemical formula on the wall in jism paint, which I still don't really know the origin of. A line later on implies that it might be bioluminescent yogurt that ended up on the island after a ship crashed onto the shore, but it very well could be paint or radioactive jizz, I don't know. There's no dialogue in this house, so you walk outside, you see the blinking red tower in the distance, and you are immediately presented with a choice, going left or right. Now, I don't know how other people play games, but typically I like to do the optional areas first before doing the progression areas. An example would be in something like God of War 2018. I would want to go down the dead end path with a collectible first, do whatever was waiting for me down there, and then go down the path with the story cutscene. Unwittingly here, I went down the collectible path first. Going left leads you down the shore of this rocky Scottish island, a setting choice that I later learned was largely due to the restriction of the original game being a Half-Life 2 mod. So they had the choice between different Half-Life landscape assets and chose the one that worked best, which was an island. That carries over to this version of the game, although it certainly does look better now in this remaster. The game is actually quite pretty in a lot of areas. It's very screenshot worthy. It's something I found myself doing as I went along, kind of like an odd hiker or tourist with a camera strapped around their neck, going to different points on the island and snapping a screenshot and then waiting around kind of awkwardly for 10 seconds or so before I moved on. Further down the shore, you find an image of the golden ratio drawn into the sand, which immediately got me overly excited that this was actually going to be some sort of mystery to be solved, or that by paying close attention, I could piece together a story beneath the story. This would not be the case, and for the sake of you having the same experience I did until I finished the game and open up the director's commentary and, God forbid, Google, I will leave it at that for now. The left path down the coast ends at a split between two cliffs with a vaguely symbolic car door at the bottom of it, which struck me as quite odd because this didn't seem like a place where cars would thrive, but I didn't question it and moved on. Along with this present cargo, there was a large quantity of antacid yogurt bound for the European market. Back along the coast the way we came, you can walk up a set of stairs towards the top of the mountain and being the fucking idiot that I am, I was looking around and didn't see the giant hole in the middle of the path and fell down. I'm going to hold back on criticizing this too hard right now, but I will say at this point in time, in my head, my first thought was, fuck me, now I have to walk all the way back up. It makes sense, you know, you can only walk in a walking sim. Aside from the pause button and the analog stick, every other button on the controller is used to zoom in. There's no sprinting. For now, that's fine, but increasingly as the game went on, and I'll point out where in particular, this becomes a pain point that works against it. 
even if the intended experience is a slow solitude one. I say this because in my dumbass little acorn brain, I didn't think that you could skirt your way around the ledge I had fallen down before, so after going up, back, and around to see the right path, I fell down to the beach again, intentionally, and walked my way back up those stairs from before. Even knowing precisely where I wanted to go, I had to slowly meander my way back up to somewhere I had already been. So it goes. Moving onward and upward, you begin to descend down the other side of the mountain you just walked up into a cave that has more radioactive jizz with different chemical formulas and seemingly biological art of squids or organisms of some kind. At this point, I was really confused and hoping at some point the weird cryptic art would be explained. It won't be, but that's what was on my mind as I followed the little tributary up the mountain to a small miniature Stonehenge. I was curious about the significance of this too, but again, it would not be explained. Just to be very clear here as well, something I always try to do is approach games on their own terms, especially as a reviewer. It's one of the reasons I don't do a lot of negative videos. When I'm streaming something or playing something and I find it to be not to my personal taste, I don't necessarily give up on the thing, but I absolutely try not to just incessantly shit on something for simply not being to my taste. Being bad and being not precisely how I would prefer things are very different states a game could be in, and I want that distinction to be clear because, again, I actually love walking sims, especially atmospheric ones like this one where I can play it without streaming it and really immerse myself in the way the game wants me to feel. I wanted this game to be good. Now, moving into the second zone, I'll let the main character talk for a moment. Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses, and have cross-referenced them within a millimeter using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turnoff for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rearview mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. Because of all the weird chemical symbols and radioactive jizz around the island, and now the crashed ship right in front of me, I thought that this was turning into a mystery of sorts. I especially thought so when in the corner of my eye, I saw a shadowy figure scaling the cliffside that disappeared once I looked at it. And right about here, I want to detail that complaint I had earlier. It's a complaint that not only I had about the game, and while I will mostly leave all of those comments until after we beat the game together in this video, the big complaint a lot of people had was feeling punished for wanting to explore. I had already started moving away from the shadowy figure by the time it popped up, and while my curiosity got the better of me and I did walk over there to see it, I immediately regretted this decision because then I had to walk all the way back over to the other side of the cliff at this slow, single pace. Always. Because that's the thing about Dear Esther, the first walking sim. Because largely no one had done this before, there was no one to find out what did and didn't work in the genre before them. Being the pioneer of a thing is not always a good thing. Moving back up the cliff here, the main character says a line that immediately swapped my running interpretation of the game. And you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk. You had been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk. The car door suddenly made sense. The line about driving the M5 highway looking for a spot that wasn't a mystery or a treasure hunt made sense. This man is a broken man missing Esther who was killed by a drunk driver. He had moved from the house on the hill down to the shore that we started on. And now we're coming back up to that house, and it remains mostly empty. I thought and hoped that there was more to the story than this, be it prose about grief and loss or something more to chew on, but sadly, I'm going to spoil it for you. There isn't. If you were to stop playing the game at this point, beyond the areas of walking you would go through later on in the game, in the very last moments of it, you could absolutely still hold a conversation with someone who had finished the game. Concrete details are already there and pretty much stop there. To catch you up to where I am with Dear Esther, though, I want to speed us along to the end of the game, because the more you learn about Dear Esther, the more frustrating it all becomes. I have seen some people genuinely defending the pace of the game with the excuse that, uh, well, he has a broken leg, he says so in the game, that's why you can't run. 
And honestly, when I initially heard the main character say this, my first thought was, aha, so you were ashamed of that and had to write an excuse in, did you? I do understand that for pacing purposes, running would break the sequencing of the game, but at the same time, I find a lot of the pacing very poor. There's long stretches that I'll begin showing glimpses of as we move towards the finale at a bit of a faster pace, where you are working towards a new dialogue activating. The main character will say something vague about Esther and how he misses her, or details the plight of Jacobson, a sheep herder who died forever ago on the island, or Donnelly, who was a cartographer that charted the island and reported on its inhabitants and then died of syphilis. The whole plot of the game, as we move through the caves into the final zone and up to the blinking red tower, is that the main character's wife, Esther Donnelly, was killed on the M5 highway by a drunk driver. In grief, for reasons unknown, he retreated to this Scottish island with notes from Donnelly the cartographer, and if your ears just perked up, I sadly do not have an answer for you as to possibly Esther and the cartographer being related, and that being the reason we're on this island. The reason I have so few answers and so little patience for this game will be very clear in a moment, right after we beat the game. In this final zone, we find shrines to different pieces of the car crash in Esther's history. In case you didn't already pick up on it, she died in a car crash. Just in case the other seven times you heard it didn't click for you, you can tell now because there's car parts fucking everywhere. I realize I sound a bit frustrated right now by all of it, but let's just get through this before I explain why. On the shore, before we ascend to the radio tower, we see an armada of little paper boats made from the letters he wrote to Esther that have been what we've been listening to up to this point. Then we move up the mountain towards its finale. Earlier in the game, the main character had said he wanted to become a seagull, starving his brain of oxygen in order to suffer delusions of transcendence. If I were a gull, I would abandon my nest and join them. I would starve my brain of oxygen and suffer delusions of transcendence. I would tear the bottom from my boat and sail across the motorways until I reach this island once again. His leg is broken and infected, and he stated that this ascent will be the last he can make before he expires. And at the top of the radio tower, the grief-stricken protagonist leaps and transforms into a gull. It's actually the best moment in the game. It's a clear use of symbolism they set up earlier on, taken to its illogical conclusion for a rather nice metaphor. We fly out over the armada of paper boats, and the game ends. So that's the Esther. Now you might be asking yourself, that was a bit slow, but what the hell was he bitching about this whole time? Well, dear viewer, like you, as I finished the game, I wasn't actually as annoyed as I am right now recording this. A bit confused maybe about the significance of some things or lack thereof, sure, but not annoyed. One of the main things that was bugging me as I played and was eventually revealed to be intentionally misleading and confusing was the clarity of characters. There's the main character, a grieving husband, Esther Donnelly, his dead wife, Jacobson, a sheep herder, and another Donnelly, the cartographer that died of syphilis. 
it's never explained in game and I couldn't figure out why Esther and the cartographer had the same last name and it was just kind of bugging me in the back of my mind. So right after finishing the game, this line on the gameplay and plot section for Dear Esther's own Wikipedia page let me know all that I needed to know and sent me on a spiral that landed me here, now annoyed. Quote, as the game progresses, the identities of the characters become more blurred and the player is made to draw their own conclusions of the story. End quote. That immediately made me decide to make a video on this game. It also made me jump right into the developer's commentary because I wanted answers and I was greeted in the first minutes with those answers to all of my burning questions. The developer's commentary was included with the landmark edition of the game, and on this developer's commentary is the lead writer, the lead composer, and the environment artist. Now, the leading line here is that, according to lead writer Dan Pinchbeck, the entire island, the plot, the game, it's all a dream. And that isn't a problem itself to me, actually. Everything about Esther, for me, is a dream. The, the landscape is not an island, it's the dream of an island. The music is like music that you've, you wake up because you've heard in your sleep, but you can, you're not conscious of hearing it. It's the thing that lead writer Dan Pinchbeck says next, and will say over and over and over and over again, that really grinds my gears. And the language in the story was supposed to be like that as well, of it didn't matter the sense it made, it was more about the, the kind of, the shapes it created, if that makes sense. And it's really, I, I still love that about the game. It's one of the things I love so much about Nigel's voiceover is it has this really odd, disconnected, kind of dreamlike quality to it where you might finish the game and not actually understand anything that happened, but you'd have been carried along in the flow of it. Um, and without any kind of sarcasm at all, I get into trouble saying things like this. The same design principle applies as this to Halo. The same design principle applies as this to Halo. Quote. The language in the story was supposed to be like that as well. It didn't matter the sense it made. It was more about the kind of shapes it created. Skipping ahead a bit, Dan says, quote, It's one of the things I love so much about Nigel's voiceovers is that it has this really odd, disconnected, dreamlike quality to it, where you might finish the game and not actually understand anything that happened. Interpretation is a funny thing, and if you look at any authors or directors that make a confusing film or book or piece of media, possibly with a ambiguous ending to it, when interviewed and asked about the real ending to their piece of media, what really happened, they all say you should just interpret it yourself. What absolutely none of them say is that it doesn't matter if it makes sense, or that they love the fact that you might end the experience having no clue what the fuck just happened. I'm hesitant to ascribe meaning to anything because in the dev commentary you could give yourself alcohol poisoning by playing a drinking game taking a shot every time the writer says it doesn't matter or you aren't supposed to understand. They try and come across in the commentary is trusting of the player to extrapolate some sort of meaning or feeling from the game, and while that is understandable and is absolutely how art should be for everyone, the more I listen to the dev commentary where they constantly undercut their own creative work, the only thing that I really felt was as if my time would have been better spent elsewhere. Something I found with the cursory Google I did after beating the game was actually a lot of criticism that had been levied at the game as being pretentious. And after listening to the director's commentary, yeah, it's really fucking pretentious. And so really trying to create a space that had all of these kind of subliminals in it was a really interesting thing that we wanted to do, both with the original and then I think it got lifted up into a much more sophisticated version when we went to the commercial because Rob Zell to bring that sort of level of artistry to the visuals that really got that kind of uh, sense of hidden meaning in there. And that was really important given how kind of complex and symbol heavy and poetic the story is, where a lot of it doesn't, again, doesn't actually make any sense. I thought this was like students that got given a grant and a budget to make a game, 
but it's not. These were professors that got given a grant to make a game, and in making that game, they made what was, at the time, a weird choice where they only allowed the player to walk. This gave it a sort of infamy, and they rode that infamy to release and re-release the game across consoles and generations, onto phones even, until they backed themselves into a corner with a developer's commentary that desperately tries to dance around the fact that the debates they keep referencing, if they can even be called that, these debates over the meaning of the game are in and of themselves meaningless because the writer of the game himself says that plot and details don't matter about 200 times. I have never seen someone so focused on stomping all over their own creative endeavor. Christ. The more you see behind the curtain, the worse it gets too, because then you listen to them talk about how they randomized damn near everything in the game. The bits and pieces around the island, like scenery and some of the weird radioactive jizz paint, that's randomized, because fuck it, there is no meaning. Maybe I'm just missing the dear Esther lore master that can explain to me in no uncertain terms why the hell electronic diagrams and chemical formulas are strewn all over the island in cum paint, but I sure don't fucking get it. And then they mention how the dialogue is, you guessed it, also randomized. If you ask them, they say that it's so each player comes away with a different experience. If you remember at the start of the video, I mentioned Stanley Bearable as one of my favorite games. That is a walking sim with different branching dialogue to it where each player comes out of it with their own unique experience. Dear Esther is not that. Not even close. I do realize that this is probably partially due to the fact that this was the first of its kind, more or less, but according to the director's commentary, at every point where you receive dialogue, there's actually four narrative instances that could play. What this means functionally is that every time you hit a trigger for dialogue to play, you roll a dice on what you get out of four possibilities. Did I get randomly rolled out of an explanation about the chemical signs all over? Did I get randomly rolled out of an explanation of Esther and Donnelly, the syphilis-ridden cartographer having the same last name? Do I have syphilis? Do you? Who the fuck knows? The devs themselves say it doesn't matter. The lead writer of Dear Esther in one interview mentioned William S. Burroughs as an influence, which I find pretty funny, and if you don't know who he is in a minute here, you might find this pretty funny too. Burroughs wrote a book called Naked Lunch, which was banned from publication in some places around the world for being so goddamn indecent, and honestly, it is actually a bit much. I think hardly anything is so indecent that it justifies censorship, especially not a story like Naked Lunch, but yeah, it's definitely a lot. For me, this was a moment where I actually used the math formula that I learned in school in real life. Like, you know the joke about wishing algebra would help you with your taxes? That kind of happened for me here. I had a professor in college that had me read Naked Lunch, and I thought to myself after finishing that book, that was fucking weird and probably never going to come up again, but here we are. Naked Lunch is a non-linear novel where you could kind of make a timeline of important things that happen, but especially towards the end of the book, it just gets utterly schizophrenic and loses all semblance of reality until it just kind of ends. It's vaguely about a drug addict that thinks he's being hunted by the government, but beyond that, I'm remiss to say anything concrete about it because frankly, the book didn't make a ton of sense to me. The reason I find it so funny that Dear Esther's writer references Burroughs as a direct influence is because I can almost guarantee you that he specifically meant Naked Lunch. It's clear to me that he was trying to emulate Burroughs' narrative structure, or lack thereof, or at the very least tries to achieve what Naked Lunch does, which is painting a weird abstract picture rather than a neat front-to-back plot. I don't think Dear Esther achieves that. Frankly, I don't think it even comes close. Naked Lunch is weird and funny and has all of these quirky little quips from someone who's a very talented writer and also very clearly a real-life junkie. He manages to relay things that were unique to his experience with that lifestyle in this fictional setting. All I find that Dear Esther achieved in that regard was being vague about a series of events with a backstory that isn't vague at all. It felt like they chickened out of being genuinely weird and abstract halfway through, which leaves you in this weird middle ground of understanding enough to piece together what the basics are, but being intentionally denied a further explanation because it's a dream and fuck it. Plot and dialogue doesn't need to make sense as long as you feel something, I guess. I love weird literary experiences as much as the next guy, but this isn't it. 
And what kills me is that this would have probably been a really, really good short story. And by the way, while I'm thinking of it, if you didn't think that I thoroughly made my point earlier that the devs ruined their moderately fine game by talking about it, here's Dan Pinchbeck saying that Dear Esther revolutionized cave design in video games, which is possibly one of the single most pretentious and annoying things I think you could ever say about a game that has little to no cultural significance beyond probably being the first walking sim. I just want to say that um, I think you can divide caves and games into pre and post Dear Esther. I think that it's just a, a way of breaking away from reality into saying what you can do with these spaces that actually makes them this incredibly much more um, vividly colourful and much more kind of interpretative and look from it. And it's really interesting that I, I kind of, I look at caves now in, in games and I find myself going that's a very Rob Briscoe cave <laughs> and I think that's a really an amazing thing to have achieved so I, I think it's one of those it's great paying other people's work compliments I, I enjoy that because you never feel like you're being big-headed about yourself but I think it is Dear Wrestler's team of Dan Pinchback, his wife Jessica Curry, who did the music, and the rest of the team were under the umbrella of the Chinese room. Moving on from Dear Esther, they were contracted by Frictional Games to make Amnesia a machine for pigs, and then went out on their own and made Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Funnily enough, I'm almost certain I received both Dear Esther and Everyone's Gone to the Rapture for free on PlayStation Plus years ago, uh, and I got Dear Esther on PC through a Humble Bundle. What I'm getting at here is that I didn't acquire any of these games on purpose. I mentioned their other games though because as frustrating as it is hearing them talk about Dear Esther, they did go on to make Machine for Pigs and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, which are both respectable enough games in their own right. Rapture in particular is actually pretty good despite having largely the same structure as Dear Esther, and without going into a whole review of that game, I think they mainly succeeded there where Esther failed because they had a much shorter stick up their ass when they made it. 2017, the Chinese room got acquired and they had to fire all of their staff besides Dan and Jessica. They made some mobile games, they remade the remake of Dear Esther at this point. Oh, and uh, what's this? Then they got hired to make Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. What the fuck? <laughs> So sorry, this is half of a joke because it is true. They are the team working on that game currently. I just wanted to surprise you seeing that in the list of their projects uh, as much as it surprised me. The team is, as far as I can tell, only the same in name. Little to none of the original team is still there. Pinchbeck retired in 2023 and Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 was handed over to the team that remains at the Chinese room after Hardsuit Labs got booted off the project. I, uh... This, this feels a little similar to me to Bloober being handed the rights to Silent Hill 2 Remake after making Layers of Fear. Just such a weird choice. I have no clue how that's going to go. I do sincerely hope that my frustration with this game after hearing the dev commentary is something most people who played the game never experienced. If I just finished the game and walked away without engaging with the dev commentary or any of the online resources on the game, I probably would have put it in the mental folder of unremarkable but visually nice with the good soundtrack. Dear Esther was, yes, one of the first walking sims. And in sync with the genre it spawned, the game had to, slowly, ever so slowly, stumble and tumble and trip and fall all over to pave the way for other games to follow it. I'm glad it exists as a piece of history, but in this rare case, they would have been better off leaving the development and writing process of the game as obscure as the plot of the game. Thanks for watching. I found a little detail while I was editing that I want to stick here at the end of the video uh, for anybody that stuck around. Uh, in the credits for the game, they list on their list of thank yous, Jonathan Blow, who is the guy that created a game called Braid and another game called The Witness. If you don't know what those are, uh, there is a video by a guy named Joseph Anderson. It's very compelling. And the main synopsis or theory that he has in that video is that Jonathan Blow made The Witness uh, to fuck with people. Like, that's the whole point of the video is that he thinks it's just to fuck with people. There's like all these like little hidden meanings all over and everything. And Joseph Anderson theorizes that it's just, just one big joke at the expense of the player that there is no meaning. And that just, that just tickles me silly that they credited Jonathan blow of all people, uh, with a thank you in the credits of dear Esther.
Anyways, I'm going to get out of here. Thanks for watching.